On uh, behalf of the Undergraduate Lecture Committee, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Graham, uh, the speaker tonight. My name is Kevin Daly. And uh, I think like, like many people practicing and teaching in Los Angeles, um, I've been fortunate to watch Sarah Graham and Mark Angelo's practice develop over the last 10 years or so. Their practice is based here in Los Angeles and also in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, Sarah's academic background started at Harvard and she's recently returned there last year as a critic. Um, she's very active in the um, thesis program at USC and um, seems to have sort of a shimmer-like appearance on professional juries and awards programs and it's hard to find one where she's um, not either um, on the jury or in the uh, awards category. Um, I think since um, I've been going over to Switzerland in the last several months or so, um, visiting Sark in, in Vico, um, I've realized that um, Sarah and Mark's practice, based in both places, sort of neutralizes the, the premise that your fame increases with the distance um, from, from your actual place of work. And Sarah and Mark's work here in Los Angeles, um, where they've made some, some very beautiful and delicate things, uh, in some ways is, is, um, is reflected in a, in a very um, opposite way over there, where they have very sizable work um, in, in, like, towns. Um, and this is in a country where I think about a third of the population uh, is practicing architects. Um, and I. Most recently, Sarah and Mark have won, um, and uh, this str has struck me either as um, a mark of Swiss efficiency or um, possibly just, just tremendous irony, uh, the midfield dock at the Zurich airport, and I guess just because they're going through there all the time anyway, they, they uh, decided to redesign the place. Um, when, when we started going to, to, to Vico, one of the Swiss students as I was meeting the students visiting there and living there, um, asked me what I thought about the um, experimental house. And, and it surprised me both that it was, it was so taken for granted by, by students living over there and learning about architecture there. And I realized before answering him that, that I wasn't you know, precisely sure of exactly what the experiment was. And, and I think there, there are a lot of possibilities for that. Um, that, that are reflected in Sarah and Mark's work. Um, one is, is sort of an experiment in just a real isolation and elimination of variables, and the building is, is, is um, very carefully made, and, and the pieces themselves are so, so separate that it, it just is a, is a beautiful thing to, to be able to walk through. Um, it's also sort of an experiment, I think, in, in a type of inversion. Um, the lightness of the structure um, and the sort of reversal of expectation about this, this, what I would consider a tremendously light foundation that sort of grips and crawls up the hill um, was, was very striking to me. And, and seeing that type of building and seeing a type of building that is built with such, with such um, care and delicacy is really impressive. And I think more important for me, the, the building is kind of about both an adherence and an avoidance of conventional building technique. And I think Sarah and Mark's work is one that's, that's, um, that's very much engaged in, in, in technique. And I think tonight I'd like to see how the rest of the data and the experiments are coming in along with you. When I came in and learned that Kevin was going to be introducing me, I felt like I was really at home and we were probably just going to have dinner afterwards. It, it's, it's so familiar being here. Um, very much I want to thank you for the invitation to come. I want to thank you on behalf of, of Mark Angelil and myself. And uh, I'm particularly delighted to see the infiltration of students from the other side of the city come in. Um, and the, the goldfish wall as we entered is, I think, about the nicest thing I've ever seen in, in my behalf. And no, we didn't just get an aquarium to, to celebrate it. Um, I was specifically asked to come tonight and speak to you about our work. And this is in lieu, I suppose, of, of 
my speaking about some more theoretical kind of project um, of any of the research we might be involved with, as for example, with a couple of student projects that are on the wall, some of the investigations into urbanism, which we've been involved with for the last couple of years, working with students in various places. Um, the, the edge city or city X or the city without qualities are all possibly terms which might begin to describe this post-urban condition, which is really the same worldwide, from Los Angeles to Mexico City to the outside of Manila or Milan. Um, and I'm particularly intrigued by the potential of this area, which architects have largely abandoned, but simultaneously is the location of most of the development worldwide today. The reason I mention it and the relationship to our work is that um, we are very much involved with, with a dialogue between theory and the history of ideas on one hand, and the arena of construction and production in the other. Um, we tend to view design as a series of laboratory experiments, and in this we conceive of the work as a kind of research, for it involves thesis, counter-thesis, exploration, and experimentation. Um, it inv our work tends to involve uncertainties and often put what we're doing at the edge of the field rather than any central position. For example, on the wall we have on your right is a competition we did this year in Barcelona for the area around the soccer stadium in Barcelona. It was an urban design ideas competition that was open that we uh, won as a, a split first prize. And on your left is a dental clinic interiors that we did when we were in Zurich. We're um, also interested very much in opening up the field of investigation of what is traditionally considered architecture. I would say that today, at the end of the 20th century, architecture could be understood as an open discipline, and by that I mean that it can and possibly should be open to other disciplines and able to learn from them. And simultaneously, architecture as an open text can allow for multiple readings which are not limited to a specific framework. Nobody works alone. We, we work very much as a team, as a collective of individuals in two very different countries, Zurich and Los Angeles. Um, and as a collective undertaking, we attempt whenever possible to work in an a-hierarchical structure. This does not mean a, a like-thinking, single-minded family, but more implies a group of professionals who are uh, cooperating together with mutual respect and enthusiasm. So we have the, the Swiss team on, on your uh, left and obviously the Los Angeles team on your right. As architects, all of us operate on the one hand in a field of very high precision like surgical instruments with, with precision tools operating with very small tolerances. And at the same time, construction is the messy world of fast action, improvisation, and very large tolerances. So between these, what I'd like to do is to posit a kind of theoretical scaffolding, but also made possibly with, with elasticity, with elastic concepts, which are not clearly fixed and can be um, rewritten. What, what we've tried to think of as an open-ended problem solving. We have a major problem with the order of slides here. Um, why don't I go forward and see what happens? Okay. Um, we have been influenced by a term concrete abstraction, which was described in Roland Barthes' essay on the Eiffel Tower as um, the idea that prose and structure can exist simultaneously. And here at the level of a chess game, Mark and I developed this project, which is of a desert museum, in which we were matching move for move as the design process itself. We were searching here for a generative grammatic of architectural form, to paraphrase Noam Chomsky, a rule system from within the formations process itself. 
And in this sense, we were looking for a deep structure or structure of relationships of, um, as opposed to a surface structure would be, which would be based on formal patterns. And in the practical world, in the, in the normal world of, of practice, a similar process occurred in the lunch shelter process, in the lunch shelter project. Here the client established a tactic of introducing new information at every juncture. So the work became a kit of parts in which uh, incoming bits of information were operating without hierarchy, which is not so unusual. Um, and out of that we were trying to piece together the process of, of proceeding. In this case, the Los Angeles Unified School District asked us to design a prototype structure for providing protection from the sun and the rain for children eating lunch on various school grounds. Each shelter required the placement of a roof, uh, a concrete slab with sewer drain for washing down sandwiches and so forth, um, and simply location of existing tables and chairs. So in a way it's an ideal piece because all we had to do was a lot of little roofs. Each of the shelters were to be potentially transportable to other sites as the school district um, demographics would change over time. Uh, the program involves the specificity of 50 different site conditions throughout Los Angeles and at the same time the prototypical structure was to be mass produced using common construction techniques. We determined the size of these units should be not only that which would efficiently cover tables and chairs, but which should fit on the back of a standard truck for transportation to the sites. So we were, we begged OV Arapin partners on our first collaboration to work with us on what was possibly the smallest project that they'd ever undertaken. And working then with Mike Ishler, who was in the office, we developed the structures into a series of modules which can be multiplied into various configurations. So each of the unit describes three structural principles. We have the cantilever, a double curved roof surface, and a three hinged arch that exists when the, when the pieces are connected together. Uh, the units are based on two legs. For some reason, Mike and I started describing all this in very anthropomorphic terms, but each unit was a couple of legs that is connected by a spine, off of which we have ribs that are placed um, offset from one another, so to describe the double curved roof surface. And on, on top of that structure, there are heavy sheet metal plates that are just heavy enough to support a couple of kids on bikes that will inevitably climb onto the thing. In order to have a minimum disruption of the schoolyard, uh, the, the units were shop fabricated and trucked to the site, and the field work was limited to pin connections at the base of each of the legs and then between the units, so that the entire assembly of the shelters themselves, although exclusive of the concrete slab, was really only a couple of days per school. Um, and we had a good time finding anti-graffiti paint and using then galvanizing for the structural frame to describe for the kids not only what we hoped was a playful structure, but one that might be a bit illustrative of, of how pieces can come together themselves. Um, this is an installation project that was based on collaboration with energy specialists as well as structural engineers. And here is, this is a proposal that we made where we've been premiated by the Department of Energy and now we're busy trying to find a client for the, for the piece. It's architectural devices for the generation of solar electrical energy through photovoltaics. Uh, the idea is that we place urban installations that are located throughout the city where we use Los Angeles as a case study where we're enhancing existing spaces and, and uh, structures of the city while generating power. Each installation provides an architectural as well as a technical function and the idea is that the energy generated will feed back into the existing utilities grid simply supplementing existing sources of power. The first of the proposals was an urban square. 
uh, for public use as well as an environmentally conscious location for, um, for energy generation. And built is a double layered system of laminated structural glass over the uh, collectors themselves. The warm air that's collected between the layers can be sent to adjacent buildings to heat those buildings. But the, the particular idea is that by walking directly onto the surface of the energy generation, um, that, that, that there is a, a social awareness that's increased by, of, of energy uses. Uh, the second of the proposals was a, a freeway sound reflection wall. And the, the freeway in any large urban area provides an unlimited potential for various infrastructural components such as the generation of electrical power. And here, um, the, what we did is to simply place the uh, panels in a south-facing arc whose length would be limited only by the orientation of the freeway itself. And um, we, we see that then the, the freeways cutting through the urban or suburban area could be, again, used as a, as a multivalent in infrastructural system. So we're following the line of the panels and then orienting them in such a way to reflect sound away from adjacent neighborhoods. The third proposal, which even Mark looked at this and said, my god, you've gotten megalomaniacal on this one, which I thought was kind of a compliment of sorts. Um, the point being that any south-facing wall, particularly large south-facing walls, uh, are potential for uh, photovoltaic installation and that they can also be used as sunshade devices on the south side. So in this case, we were proposing a secondary screen that is built over a wall where we use the, the photovoltaics as brise And we tapered the, um, the structure so that there is an air chimney form so that the air coming up the side of the building is going to cool, along with the shading devices, cool the actual energy load of the building itself while we're generating power. Sim this is a very similar idea, but on the horizontal. Here we made a, a folded plate structure that is potentially used over flat roofs in the city, of which God knows we have many, whether it would be factories or schools or studios. The idea is similar that you're not only cooling the building, but you're also generating power. And also, then you're allowing for the potential of the use of the flat surfaces for open air teaching, for landscape use, uh, terraces, etc. And uh, the last proposal here is that within an urban or suburban area, um, within the landscape here, we were generating the shade structure in such a way that it's not only a space-defining element, but it becomes a localized power source. And here uh, we utilized a, a faceted roof uh, covering so that the form is, is generated by a reading of the specific architecture or of the specific geography that is found so that the piece is then an architectural interpretation of the, of the found natural topography. to Kevin's experimental house. Um, in, in the Hollywood Hills here, I think wonderfully shown by the 1968 lithographs of Ed Rouchard on a very steep piece of land under the D, specifically under the D of the Hollywood sign, we undertook an investigation to explore a dialogue between typical residential construction, which is notoriously rough, and uh, precision of means that can be expressed through construction and minimal enclosure. We were conscious of attempting to develop a hybrid order, as per Michel Foucault speaks of in his introduction to the order of things. The starting point here was a very steep hillside that we terraced in conformity with the local zoning requirements, and we felt that the, um, uh, or we knew that, that engineering, both civil and structural, would be a significant component of the work, which is something that we very much welcomed. 
The idea was to build a very small house that would not feel the limitation of its area, and the architecture would be dependent upon the tectonics of its, of its own making and production rather than any image-oriented figuration. And we anticipated that by encouraging various modes of making, the rough and the precise, etc., that we would indeed end up with a, a rather hybrid structure, which was accepting contradictions rather than one that was aiming toward any single purity of conception. Um, this was the second time we got on our knees and begged Arup to do a project that was much smaller than those that they usually undertake. Um, but in, in working with their office, we were able to develop a hillside strategy that terraced the steep land into two garden levels that are supported above and below by significant retaining walls and that are linked every 10 feet on center with a grid of um, grade beams. So this formed a kind of warped structural ladder that was uh, stabilizing the hill. And between that, we set the house, which is a relatively light wooden box, on standard residential footings. Uh, we were quite intrigued that the that all of the forces of the house had no effect whatsoever on the retaining system for the hill itself. The city of Los Angeles was also intrigued. They'd never seen such a thing. And, um, and they kept asking if they could send their baby building engineers out to learn about these. Th and so we kept accidentally losing the drawings because that was the last thing we wanted climbing around the house. And then on, as the model we have here, the complete piece that's sitting on the foundation system itself. The house is a, is a wood box of standard two by six walls uh, construction. It has a small footprint and very tall double height spaces. The intention is that the entity can be read as a single space so that rooms are not defined per se. Um, Besides the foundation, the, the fun of the house for us particularly was the construction of the roof, which has fully been dislocated from the vertical wall enclosure. So we have tapered steel beams that are supporting the roof plate. They're pin connected to a steel frame which is embedded within the front wall. And then that is held down by a tension cable in the front producing an oversized cantilever, which is then held down in the back by a very light cable that's only working in terms of wind load or, or uh, earthquake uplift. Then there was the construction phase. Um, we were not at all disappointed in our expectation of imprecision. When, when we signed the contract with the subcontractor for concrete and who assured us that he would work to an eighth of an inch tolerance. Uh, well, in reality, when he was placing some significant anchor bolts in the front wall to hold up a cantilevered front concrete stair, those anchor bolts, which were over an inch in diameter, were misplaced by 30 inches vertically and horizontally. So. What does one do? Yes, I got extremely crabby, but that doesn't do a lot of good because you're not about to relocate pieces like that. And so once again, one realizes that construction is improvisation and you deal with it. You simply move forward and in this case, you redesign the stair. So after the concrete phase, which was fully half of the budget of the house, then we're into the steel, which was wonderful to have these french fry-like structures that were just sticking up on the, on the side of the, of the hill. And uh, we had hoped, Mike and I had hoped, that we would really be able to have the, the steel stand in place without a single stick of wood to hold it. And then we figured we could go home, we were done. But we needed a couple of, of sticks of wood to hold the thing in place. And then there's the wood phase, which of course is always terrific fun in, in the construction process because you're going through the, the framing and then the, the, the gradual enclosure of the piece. Um, here we were 
we were, again, consciously working with systems that were impure. In this case, in order to maximize a, a lightness of construction, which is something we wanted to generate because of this climate we're in, um, we, we were using wood to partially um, stabilize the steel, which is, which is rather hybrid in terms of, of structural thinking. There are these moments in construction which I truly love. There are moments that come and go. They really are a, a temporary installation art, such as the day that you get there, and suddenly there is a Cristo that's sitting wrapped on the hill. And it goes away again, and no one else notices it. But um, I think that these, these elements that are seen and not seen are, are very much part of the art of what we do, and uh, we truly enjoy them. On the completed piece, the, uh, just to keep talking about the thinking of the house, the, the lateral shear walls have been displaced from the primary structural grid. It results from an in an interior spatial shift, and it also allows things like the final column to be floating in space, which is not an efficient use of the, of the structural system, but it was one that we fought hard for because we really loved this piece, and we thought it would be terrific to let it just fly there. Um, so even Mike comes and pats it when he comes visiting now, even though he thought we were nuts when we were saying that on the one hand we like structural engineering very much, and on the other hand it didn't necessarily have to be about efficiency. We have large openings in the house that are um, as much as possible, as much as allowed within reasonable building codes, simply making the envelope disappear when possible and intentionally blurring the distinction between the interior and the exterior. And not unlike a lot of projects in this part of the world. We also utilize standard industrial products, which were here left completely undisguised. But is, is this is a, a, a building that's more about the structure and the light and the space. It's not like the work of many of, my, of our colleagues about forms and surfaces. Um, there's, there's a minimalism in terms of the, the palette of materials that we used. So the, the painter was just delighted when we said, base white, the whole house, run with it. Um, it was not a careful study of, of, of forms and textures. We have um, sliding partitions replace interior doors. And the, the views from the house, rather than capitalizing on any potential panorama available by the canyon, really exist more in, in places that are peripheral to one's view, so that they are fragmenting uh, one's sight from the interior and the exterior. And um, not only are they reflecting various different conceptions of the different walls, but they provide rather unexpected viewing lines to the landscape that's beyond. Um, and by being in the hills, I take a particular pleasure in the fact that we live in a city of 15 million people, and at the same time, we deal with the critters. The, the wildness of backing onto Griffith Park is really uh, quite fantastic, and um, the fact that there's a wildness potential within the city that's not only an, an urban wildness, I, I enjoy a lot. And a, a couple of details. Of, of the piece. This is the, the stair where our friends, the concrete subcontractors, mislocated things so greatly. Here's a project for an open competition in Zurich. We came in second, and this is one of those cases where second place, you're the first loser, because uh, you didn't get the commission. But this was one that we did uh, thinking about open structures. We did the work after rereading Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus, where we were operating with rhizome structures, non-central, non-hierarchical, multiple and simultaneous. The idea here, it was a school, it's a trade school in Zurich, um, and we simply organized the program by stacking like functions, which structurally were organized by a series of parallel shear walls. Then we ran random cuts throughout the pile that were intended to bring light and air down to various levels in various places. Uh, what interested us in the, in the project is that um, with 
such non-specific programming and so forth that the, the building has the potential for open-ended expansion along any of the three coordinates, vertically or horizontally. Land artworks are interventions in an existing context that are often occurring as precise moves. Um, actions such as digging, cutting, extending can then be read as, as a kind of cartographic note. These moves tend to transform an existing landscape rather than merely being the context for the object that's in question. These ideas and conceptions were the generator of our first conceptions of, the, of our Esslingen Town Center that, again, came from readings of land art. The project is a, is a first place award of an invited international architectural competition in which, which is uh, located in a small town just outside of Zurich, about 20 minutes from the city of Zurich. The competition brief asked for new definitions for the community between the city and the country, for a synthesis of living and working, as well as proposals for alternative energy use. The program is a town center for the town of Esslingen. It's 15 ha 50 housing units, um, office, retail, light industrial buildings, light rail train station, station restaurant, post office, bus square, uh, underground or lower level parking garage, and what may become a, a cooperative market. The existing context when we tried to analyze what we found there, uh, we found that the human intervention was a little bit hard to get a handle on. And so what we decided to do was to make readings of the existing landscape. So through, through a reading, I think is the right word, of the topography, the waterways, the vegetation, as well as solar orientation and, and the views to the Alps, uh, the project is really an architectural response to this existing landscape. A small river which is cutting through the center of the site allows for a division of the project into two halves, which we made as, as public and private. And from the topography, the water, and the vegetation, we delineated a penetrable wall, which then programmatically became the office, retail, and, and light industrial buildings. The south face of this continuous or semi-continuous wall utilizes the southern exposure of the water's edge with a solar trap wall. And um, in addition, the mass of the buildings help protect the, the privacy of the housing that's north of it from the, the sounds of traffic around the site. Environmental concerns played a significant role from the beginning. It was really a pleasure to have an opportunity and then a client who was willing even to pay for some kind of environmental design, which currently is what happens in Switzerland and, and in much of Germany, which is something that hasn't really evolved here because the economics are not seen to work, but it, it will come, and I think it's a terrific opportunity for all of us, but it adds another layer investig of investigation into our work. And here, one of the things we were able to do was to have to determine what is meant by uh, energy conscious design or environmental design. And in this project, what we determined in conjunction with the engineers we were working with there was that um, this implies land use, energy use, as well as materials use. Then on the south side of the site, uh, it's the quality of the open space that's defined. We, we articulated the public structures as freestanding objects that are um, placed in the field. There are various spaces of intentionally open-ended geometries and various configurations and purposes. The bus distribution square, a linear commercial walkway, a rather wild landscape near the waterway, and a, a, a village green. 
The train station is the, um, acts as the transportation hub for the suburban area. So this is the end of a light rail train station coming in from Zurich, at which point the buses distribute people into the, into the rural area. These are a couple of models that we made, working models of that public sector. Um, the one that is on your right is one where we were simply looking at the forms and textures and surfaces of the horizontal plane of that public sector. Then on the north, a, a dense residential fabric, which is in uh, juxtaposition to the openness of the, the public zone to the south. Um, here the density is attempting to accommodate the private and intimate functions of housing and it was intentionally avoiding the expression of a suburban enclave. So with alternating row houses, uh, green zones and small streets we were forming an, an urban neighborhood. Um, Again, my true enjoyment of construction and the, the temporary set pieces that we see. Yes, it is Switzerland and things are all lined up and orderly, but, um, but, but there is an incredible beauty that comes from these temporary pieces, such as even the, the steel um, riffraff that's placed in for the relocation of the waterway. And that has been changed into concrete, but it's quite lovely. Um, and also there's just an, an understanding of construction one gets from these pieces. As soon as you see these reels of post-tensioning, it's, it's pretty easy to understand what all of that is about, but there, there's simply a beauty in the pieces themselves. And yes, it's Switzerland, it's very orderly. The, the part that is built, the public sector, is up and functioning now as, as well as one of the office buildings. And here we have the roof of the light train station, which you see from a, across the green zone, the post office. Um, the, the, if these were reversed, this is my mistake, then one would begin to see the public space that occurs between the the light rail train station and, and the post office um, where we have roofs for the buses and for bicycles and so forth. Some construction details. What is, which, what is really nice there is that um, drawings get built and they get built the way you draw them, which is something that those of us who work here are not particularly used to. And as I tried to figure out why, obviously there's a tradition of craft, which is lovely, but the people who are on site doing the work um, also don't speak the language of the place. Um, it, it used to be that many of the construction workers were Italians, now largely they're uh, Eastern Europeans, and so they also can't read the blueprint. So it's no different than what happens here. Um, the only thing that I can really figure that is different is that they start drinking beer at 9 o'clock in the morning. So from my point of view, we might as well give it a go and maybe things here will start getting built better. And uh, here's the, the post office in, in some unusually nice and sunny weather. Uh, the interior of the post office. There we were able to work with a roughness of materials. <coughs> excuse me, which was shocking for them. They think this concrete work is awful and should be covered up. We think it's lovely. Um, and we were able to work with materials of a, of a public and hard use building like a post office so that the tiles are asphalt tiles and so forth, um, which was a whole new idea for many of the Swiss, but we loved it. This is the just finished first office building where what we're looking at here is the south-facing wall that has its solar trap wall system and an entire overlay, almost a permanent scaffolding of various pieces that can block the light or diffuse the light as well as to, to uh, let the sun heat the space for the building beyond. One of the, the pieces here that I like the best you almost can't see is that we realized that we could have um, shading louvers that are actually made out of an almost clear glass so that it, it blocks about 80% of the light, but it doesn't ever block the view. Interiors of that building. 
And that's Esslingen, okay. Um, this is a project that we did here. Um, this was just a, a fun project we did where we wanted to explore cartography and computer-aided design and manufacturing in relationship to, to design. The usual process of architectural work, usual, whatever that might mean, um, involves typically architects presented with a site and a program which we are expected to formally resolve into built space. This implies that construction and production are the means or tools by which architects architecture can be made. We thought that uh, with technologies changing, particularly through computerization, that it was a good time to re-examine some of the traditional assumptions of design and also the methodologies of making. Here we began with a contemporary articulation possibly of, of topography in which one simply plots out space as three coordinates. And with this, we then define a, a site model. And the thinking of the building was a, a similar one in that we were looking at the sections of the land to try to figure out how to generate space that could be occupiable in relation to that land. Uh, this is a building project that was completely about the section. I, I know we never drew any plans with the thing. It didn't seem to be the point. So again, we were trying to read the land and interpret how that might turn into building. The program here was to be um, living and working spaces for a group of unrelated people, which are sometimes united into common space, sometimes broken. And we periodically lifted the building in order to test cooling systems and so forth. So we have this um, attempted to be continuous space above which we put a, a, a super skin, which um, is shading devices and photovoltaics and landscape and so forth. Try again. There it goes. Um, and so here we, we show some of the pieces of the, of the program, but you can see that the entire intention is, is how to pull from the land in an attempt to de-objectify a building and to see if it's possible indeed to have more of an integration of, of the land with the structure itself. The piece started with a, with a folded frame whose idea we got from the traditional European measuring stick. And the, this primary structure is a series of folded frames which are largely triangulated. Um, that are made in the factory as triangles. They're shipped to the site and then erected quite simply, simply. So our thinking was to use the most traditional and cheap construction, which would be 2 by 12s And though to integrate computer-aided manufacturing simply because each piece had to be a different length. And if, as we've learned from previous projects, people don't tend to measure, and so therefore there would need to be another system which we wanted to turn over the computer in order to get the various lengths. And computer-aided manufacturing, of course, is something that's um, Oh, not a lot of us are using here. We're beginning to use more of it in our work in, in Europe. And of course, it's completely depended upon for other aspects of design, such as automobile or airplane design. So again, we were trying to take the, the cheapest possible construction method and test it in order to see what we could come up with. In the project, um, above the folded structural system, we have a, a skin of triangulated planes of plywood, which when they cover the, the frames make the entire habitable space as a hollow beam that's made out of triangulated surfaces. And then on top of that, we were putting what we were calling our super skin of louvers or windows or landscape or whatever it might be that needed to come onto to the surface of the building itself. The triangulization is simply so that, again, it can be folded and trucked. And here, this high-tech high system is tested by some USC students who bring out the Toyota, unfold the sticks, put them up, and prop them into place, and they go home. M 
most currently, as Kevin mentioned, on our agenda is a competition for a new airport terminal that we've undertaken in Zurich with the office of Martin Spuler. And here the, the process followed a very familiar one in which teams are submitted or invited to submit qualifications out of which a group, in this case six, were selected to compete for the project. Somehow we got shortlisted um, with a very impressive group of, of contenders, Richard Rogers and Kala Trava, HOK, um, from Zurich, Theo Hotz with Von Gerken from Germany. We have no idea why we got shortlisted. We were definitely the only ones who've never built an airport terminal, but we were delighted, so we worked pretty hard for a long time. And possibly about a month into the work, um, it became clear that the client, which is the airport authority of Zurich, didn't really have the money they thought they did in terms of matching the program to the, to the referendum funds. So at that point, we thought that we should alter our strategy away from the big space of high technology, which we'd had a terrifically good time of, of playing with models of various volumes. And frankly, we also recognized at that point that we probably couldn't out technology or out detail people like Richard Rogers or Santiago Calatrava. So we might as well take this potential of the reduced budget and see what we could do with it. So we used the logic of limited resources to form a strategy of making architecture of banality, of what we started to call the poetics of everyday life. And in this, we're working with a completely stripped down aesthetic of exposed functional surfaces and minimal layers. In this case, then, we require each material and each layer to function doubly or more. And the, the, the logic is fundamentally environmental because we're putting less stuff there. We've, all, we've not only reduced the building layers, but we also reduced the air handling and mechanical systems as necessary um, so that the, the building skins themselves have to form a significant amount of the climatic um, environmental response. We were able to pare this down so much that the, the technical jury, which was serious, um, didn't first believe the, the mechanical calculations, and so they give us extra points if, if we were proven correct. I love the idea of extra points in a competition. Um, this is a public building in a relatively cold climate in a conservative society where 20th century architecture has typically manifested itself in multiple layers of argue, arguably justifiability. Um, but here what we did is we simply reversed the strategy and we stripped that down and uh, we were able to develop a strategy that won the competition. So this is not the sexy scheme of 19th century train station nostalgia that's combined with exposed structural connections. But instead, it's a, it's a vision about light and air and uh, the environment and minimalism. So we were quite surprised and delighted we won. So now we have to resolve the contracts and build the thing, which is great. To conclude, um, we're quite interested in issues that are at the edge of the field, so to speak, um, and the point is that we are looking toward um, expanding the traditional boundaries of operation within architecture. In doing so, I'd like to question the idea of the egocentric architect um, and would like to refer, for example, to such fields as genetics and ask that can we as architect authors um, at least in part, off, operate behind the scenes so that the structure of the work and the information codes can become the, the resultant work itself. In uh, referring to aesthetics and its relation to the building process, I'd also like to question the dominance of pictorial image-oriented figuration in the design process. And I believe that the structure of the building's process and production's mechanisms 
can allow us to develop other ideas of aesthetics that are more in keeping with, with those processes themselves. Multiple heterogeneous and um, hybrid techniques influence the real condition of buildings, so can't they, rather than compositional issues, influence the aesthetics that we're working with as, as well? We really have no idea where this is leading. It is merely a series of attempts to reconsider and, and hopefully broaden the role of the architect to test aesthetics to be possibly in dialogue with current modes of production, and to view architecture as an open discipline. Um, this leads to experiments that are involving multiplicities. The development is not foreseeable, but hopefully it's promoting other orders in the area of inclusion. Thank you. They told me it was a loud room, but it sounds great when you're clapping. Um, does anyone have any questions? I, at all? Are you alive? <laughs> okay. Don't tell me what I said makes sense. I don't believe it. Okay, thank you.